Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by Tower Electronics. For cables, connectors, and more, call 920-435-2973 or visit pl-259.com. And buy the ham station. Get your new radio or antenna by calling 800-729-4373 or go to hamstation.com. It's Ham Radio. Hey, good evening, everyone. It's time for another episode of Ham Talk Live. It's number 78. Some new happenings at WWV, recorded live on Thursday, August 24th, 2017. I'm your host, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Ham Talk Live. Tonight, we're joined by Matt Deutsch, uh, N0RGT, the chief engineer at radio station WWV. And uh, we'll take your calls live in just a few minutes. And uh, if you missed the show last week, Ken Olke, VE6AFO, was here to talk about the Quarter Century Wireless Association and some of their youth activities and uh, heiress donation and more. So if you missed that, check us out anytime. Just go to hamtalklive.com and um, pull up the episode you want to listen to and hit play, or you can catch our uh, podcast version on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, TuneIn, SoundCloud, or we're also over on YouTube. Uh, Before we take a quick break here and get started, I do want to mention uh, I got an email from uh, Lloyd KC5FM just a few hours ago. Um, He's with the uh, Voice Over IP Hurricane Net. Um, that uh, they're going to be um, activating tomorrow. Uh, Harvey has been upgraded to a hurricane now, and that's uh, down in the Texas area. And so they are looking for net controls uh, for the VoIP net. And um, so that's going to take place, uh, looks like tomorrow afternoon is uh, when that's going to happen, if not before. So... Uh, make sure you check that out if uh, you're on that kind of thing. If you're just on 20 meters, the um, Hurricane Watch Net on 14.325 has already started. So uh, please try to stay out of their way unless you have something to report. And that's a good place to uh, to listen as well. And uh, over on the VoIP side, check out VoIPWX.net. That's V-O-I-P-W-X.net. And uh, Lloyd just mentioned, uh, check out HumanityRoad.org. HumanityRoad.org. Check that out also. And uh, wanted me to mention that. So um, take a look there. They're going to be uh, on the air doing some uh, communications for uh, Hurricane Harvey. So um, just wanted to let everybody know that that is coming up and uh again the hurricane watch net is already going so um we're going to talk wwv here in a minute so get those uh, questions ready to go we'll talk to matt for a little bit and then you can call us the phone number to call when i tell you to is 812 net ham one that's 812 812- Six three eight four two six one, or you can Skype us at Ham Talk Live. You can also tweet us tonight. Our Twitter handle is at Ham Talk Live, and I'll let you know when it's time to call in and be back with Matt right after this word from the Ham Station right here on Ham Talk Live. <laughs> 
This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by The Ham Station. For over 37 years, The Ham Station has sold new and used radios, antennas, accessories, and equipment to hams everywhere. Give Dan or Jeff a call at 800-729-4373 or order online at hamstation.com. Ham Station carries all the major brands like Icom, Yezu, and Kenwood, and they have a wide selection of of radio scanners, MFJ accessories, Heil Sound products, amplifiers by Mirage and Ameritron, Kushcraft antennas, and more. Easy online ordering is at hamstation.com or call 1-800-729-4373 to place an order and talk it over with the experts. The Ham Station, proud to sponsor this episode of Ham Talk Live. Ham Talk Live is on your side with traffic and weather together on the 8s. Welcome back to Ham Talk Live, the ham station. They've got you covered for new and used equipment down in Evansville, Indiana. Give Dan or Jeff a call at 800-729-4373 or go to hamstation.com. Tell them you heard it on Ham Talk Live. Thanks to them for uh, sponsoring the show. Uh, They've been with us since the beginning and uh, they've got some good stuff down there. So make sure you give them a call. Uh, We're on the air every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time at HamTalkLive.com. And, of course, you can catch our replays as well. Well, uh, tonight our guest is Matt Deutsch, uh, N0RGT. He's been the chief engineer of WWV and WWVB for the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Fort Collins, Colorado, since 1989. Uh, from 1979 to 1991, he was an electronics technician for the Coast Guard, and Matt received his amateur radio license in 1992. So, Matt, thanks for joining us tonight. Well, thank you, Neil, and greetings from the oldest continuously broadcasting radio station in the world. I am ready to go. All right, and we've been we've been trying to get you on here for quite a while now, and. Uh, You've had some uh, projects you've been working on that uh, you wanted to finish up before uh, you talked about those, so we're uh, we're excited to have you on. But uh, when I first uh, was trying to get you on, we had um, a time where WWV was off the air, and, and that, that really caught me by surprise because it seems like WWV is my, my go-to reference, and I think a lot of people are that way, is... Um, okay, let's see if this antenna works. Let's see if I can get WWV. And uh, so all of a sudden there was silence <laughs> on one day, uh, but it yeah. was a lot shorter than, than you thought uh, it was. So tell us about uh, being off the air for a while, uh, what was going on with that, and uh, some of those upgrades that took place during that time. Yes, it was uh, certainly as uncomfortable for us as I'm sure as it was for the listeners. We actually received word that we were going to get enough money to upgrade the generator and the switch gear and the backup UPS for the radio station. Uh, So we were able to contract that out, purchase a generator, and but to do all the electrical work we needed to shut down the station for the safety of the contractor needed to disconnect the station from commercial power and uh, of course the generator was uninstalled so we had no uh, power and he he did a really good job and uh, actually got it done in less time than he said he would and so we were back on the air like you said a little earlier than we anticipated but certainly uh do not like to be off the air for that amount of time um and but the upgrades were sorely needed we were using a a caterpillar diesel generator that had been around since the 1960s when the station was first uh built and the associated switch gear that went with it and we were just starting to have a lot of uh problems with the generator and switch gear though our power quality has improved over the years uh, the generator and switch gear were showing its age by sometimes we'd lose commercial power, then the generator wouldn't start or it would start and not transfer to the building. And so uh, the division said it's time to solve these problems and install a, a new generator. 
So we're very happy to do that. And of course, right before you guys were getting ready to do that, what happens? <laughs> but the station goes off the air. Yeah, we well, we did have uh, during the, uh, you know, after everything was hooked up, we had a big snowstorm, and uh, that actually did knock us off the air. You know, we lost commercial power. Every Everything was hooked up, but the generator wasn't ready to go and uh, hadn't been uh, completely installed yet. And so we were off the air for two or three hours. Uh, and, you know, and so the, the uh, our transmitters are off because uh, we have no generator, but we do have a UPS that keeps our timing equipment alive. It's sort of like the Olympic flame. we got to keep the, the timing <laughs> going. And so even though we don't have a, uh, transmitters to transmit the time, we do keep the UPS on, but the UPS was running down because we didn't have a generator to recharge the UPS. So it was a, it was a close shave. We almost lost our timing, but the uh, commercial power came back just in the nick of time. Well, that, that's Murphy for you. You know, you, you plan on something and, and of course the, you know, the thing never goes down. And then of course, when, when your generator's off to switch this out, that's the time that, right that this has to happen so uh well yeah (laughs) well you're back on the on the air and and you've got the uh the new generator there um which sounds like it's uh working out real well so why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about how you do get the timing uh from nist and how you get that to audio and then how you get that uh transmit it out with uh with your antennas and erp and all that kind of stuff and tell us how you how you deliver all time all the time well i'd be glad to it's a pretty straightforward process a lot of redundancy of course built into it so that we don't make uh timing mistakes Uh, but the actual atomic clock the national standard is in boulder colorado at the department of commerce laboratories uh, in boulder and they got all the fancy stuff, the masers and the fountains and the cesiums and all that. And so what we do uh, is that we have a smaller time scale here at the station of bank of cesiums, and we average the time of all our cesiums together. So we, we come up with a what we think the time is, and the folks in Boulder have theirs, and by definition they're the correct time, so they have a certain time. And what we do is use a GPS satellite as it's going over, and um, we compare our one pulse per second uh, to the GPS, and then um, the folks in Boulder do the same thing looking at the same satellite, and we compare the times. And it's uh, analogous to, say, you have a clock tower in in a town with a, a clock on it, and you agree with someone that you want to compare times uh, you tell them at exactly 12 noon, look at your watch and see what time it is, and I'll look at mine. And so at 12 noon, you know, the guy looks at his watch, and it's 11.59. The other guy looks at his watch, and he has 12.01. And if the, by definition the guy that's 11.59 is the correct time, then the other guy is two minutes slow, and he needs to correct himself. And so the clock tower falls out of the equation. So... You know, a lot of people have said, oh, well, you're using GPS time. It's like, well, we use it as a reference. Uh, we used to use a tele- uh, television signal. It was called a Line 10 system to uh, compare the time in the past. But now we use uh, GPS. And since there's always satellites up all day long, we can compare it continuously and always steer our clocks to the Boulder clocks quite easily. Okay. So that's, uh, cool. That's uh, common view is what it's called. And then uh, so then we take that... Uh, uh, to our our seeds, our clock then puts out an ultra pure five megahertz, good to you know one part and ten to the negative thirteen, and that uh, is fed to the uh, both radio stations. WWV is here and WWVB, the sixty kilohertz station. Uh, that five megahertz is then fed to both stations and uh, fed to the time code generators, and the time code generators then slice and dice that. Um, it comes up with the one pulse per second, the ticks that you hear um, is from, you know, we have a counter inside the time code generator. It, it takes the five megahertz, counts five million counts, and puts out a, a one second pulse. And then that, you know, we create audio out of that and uh, our carrier frequencies and, uh, you know, all the other ticks, tones, 
that you hear, and like I said, the carrier frequencies, and they feed the transmitters uh, with the audio and uh, produce the carrier signal. And we actually modulate the transmitters using uh, desktop uh, signal generators. We just put the 5 megahertz in as a reference. We put the audio in as a modulating signal, an external signal, and then uh, we can modulate uh, the, whatever frequency we, we choose, uh, 5, 10, 15, so on. And then we just send that to the transmitter at a low level, and then it uh, is amplified in the transmitter, goes out to the antennas, which are, uh, you know, there's always much debate about exactly what to call them, but they are quarter wave radiating element and they're on top of a quarter wave uh, grounded antenna or tower section and there's uh, insulators in the in the middle that separate the two and so their feed point is right in the middle and so the top quarter wave section is radiating and it has a ground plane that goes down at a 45 degree angle to give us the 50 ohm input impedance to the match the transmitters and signal goes out there uh, omnidirectional okay and what uh, what kind of power and what kind of ERP uh, do you get from all of that and so is we, it the same uh, on each band yeah we, we broadcast um, you know technically I guess 2.5 megahertz is not in the HF band but uh, we always say it is and uh, so we, our lowest frequency is 2.5 megahertz, uh, and then we broadcast on 5, 10, 15, 20, and a new addition in the past couple of years is 25 megahertz. Uh, the three big ones, 5, 10, and 15, are 10 kilowatt uh, radiated power, and then the uh, uh, other transmissions are all 2.5 kilowatts. Okay, very good. So we're listening to to. All- all time, all the time, and uh, checking out to see if we can, uh, you know, get our in- antennas to work. But uh, you're able to hit uh, all kinds of devices uh, all over the country with that signal that that sync up to that uh, uh, digital um, information that you send out as well. So uh, I- I'm kind of surprised that. Uh, the power is not a little higher than that for for the hf yeah yeah it's uh um you know as uh you know i'm sure the ham community the people that work on hf you know you know propagation seems to be king you know if, if you can put out all the power in the world and and not get a signal through or you can put out a very small signal and if propagation's in your favor it goes really far so uh you know, so we had to reach a compromise at some power level when they designed the station. And uh, it virtually, you know, we hear from just about every corner of the world. Uh, we've heard from the South Pole uh, down there. They, they've they written to us and said, uh, you know, signals booming in. And we've also uh, heard from, like, South Africa and Madagascar, are sort of the furthest large areas from us. You know, we're right below us is the Indian Ocean, but... Uh, as far as large cities, uh, you know, in, in South Africa, they've picked up both the 60 kilohertz broadcast and uh, some of our HF frequencies. So we pretty much can, you know, if you got the right equipment, cover the world uh, at the receiving end. Yeah, it, it does really, really well. So uh, that's, that's pretty cool that uh, it's heard all over the world. Well, you've been working on another project and and that's the one we've been kind of waiting on uh here for you to finish up so uh tell us about this new uh project you've been working on and uh, and i think there's uh there's a little history behind that too yes uh uh you know a lot of people know we used to broadcast on 25 megahertz back in the 60s and 70s, and then you know, with the energy crunch in the 70s, those of us who remember that, uh, you know, energy was considered very expensive, and so they they wanted to do away with the 20 and 25 megahertz broadcast to save power, uh, and they decided to keep the 20, but the 25 was gone, uh, and so all this time, all these years, you know, energy isn't a uh, you know big cost factor like it used to be back then. So, um, you know, about four years ago, we 
had an outage on 20 megahertz and uh, Dean Lewis W9WGV uh, wrote to me to let me know that we had an outage and I uh, just want to know if it was his equipment or ours and I said it's our equipment it went off for just a minute and uh, he said boy I sure do miss the 25 megahertz and you know, I was reading the email to the technicians and they said well why don't we put the 25 back on what what's the big deal why do we have it off anyway you know it's it's not you know as far as power consumption you know the 60 kilohertz WWVB you know broadcast 70 kilowatts you know another two and a half kilowatts is in the noise you know so you know and so they said let's put it back on the air and so I wrote back and told Dean you know we're for a couple hours we'll put it on the air you know for old time's sake and we put it on the air and, and within a little while a gentleman in Scotland wrote us and said are you on 25 megahertz so he was the first to um, hear us uh, all the way in Scotland, on the, and we were only doing one kilowatt at the time, but it was you know during the you know the better part of the sunspot cycle. So uh, you know I called the broadcast manager, asked him if he we were gonna we'd be able to stay on the 25 for a couple of days, and he was at a, um, a Rockies game in Denver, and uh, he called back during the seventh inning stretch and said, yeah, sure, go ahead, let's you know let's do this for a little while, and uh, so, you know, the response was overwhelming. We heard from so many people saying, oh, thank you so much. You know, please keep it on if you can. And so we pretty much just never shut it off. It's still on. But uh, at one point, I was reading an article in QST uh, by uh, uh, Eric Nichols, KL7AJ. And uh, this was February 2013 uh, article. You know, and he was saying, you know, amateurs need to contribute to the radio art. You know, we're, we do a lot of talking, and you know, but we should be doing some science, too. So I was intrigued. He talked about channel probes and stuff like that. And uh, so I wrote to him and said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of confined here by exactly as much as I can do. I can't change the broadcast any. And... Um, you know, the signal has to be pretty much omnidirectional, but, you know, that just pretty much leaves me with an antenna that I can fiddle with. Is there something that would be of interest to uh, amateur radio scientists that would be helpful? And he said, well, a turnstile antenna would, um, you know, you could broadcast for a few minutes horizontal north-south, horizontal east-west, and do a right-hand circularization and then do a left-hand circularization and um and then a vertical back go back to the vertical and go between those different modes and he said you know we could probably learn a lot about the ionosphere doing that so i've been pecking away at it here for about two years uh you know trying to shoehorn it in around the uh other things going on at the station and that's why it's taken so long is that it's you know i i can't give it a high priority since it's just an experiment but um I've learned a lot. I had a dust off the Smith chart, which I haven't looked no. at in 25 years. And, <laughs> and but I mean that is that thing is fantastic. I would I encourage anyone to who's, who works with matching antennas, and that's the, the tricky bit: matching the antenna to the transmission line. And the Smith chart is amazing. I you know it's. Um, I was looking in my old double RL uh, handbook, you know, or antenna book from like the 1990s, and they had a really good treatment of it there and learned a lot and uh so the ideas for matching a antenna to a feed line are pretty numerous and so you know being a ham I, I wanted to choose the optimum solution but uh, i was realizing i didn't have time to go through the many many uh, solutions so we came up just with uh, uh right now we're just feeding it it's on the air right now uh left hand circular polarization 25 megahertz and uh and it's not changing to any other direction or mode. It's just uh, left-hand polarization for now. And I wanted to have that up and running for the uh, solar eclipse, if anyone could use it. And uh, so it's uh, been that way. I need to put it back on the vertical polarization and uh, work more on the uh, other different modes of, of polarization. So um, looking forward to doing that. And... Uh, if KL7AJ is out there listening, he needs to call in and tell us uh, more about channel probes, or or he you need to do a show with him on channel probes because yeah. I'm not sure <laughs> hey, once, this thing is, 
once this thing's built, it's going to be up to him or someone else who knows a lot about the ionosphere to explain to people how to use it. You know, I'll build it. Uh, we just need someone to explain what to do next, how to do the science. So yeah, and there's I'm looking some, forward to some input. Yeah, there's some cool science that happened uh, with the uh, eclipse, uh, looking at the ionosphere uh, out at NGIT this week, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, some of the results from them and, and find out... Uh, what all uh, they were able to learn from the uh, solar eclipse QSO party on Monday. And um, so it sounds like uh, there could be some stuff there. And, and you know, I, I remember, you know, back to the 70s, you know, WWV has always kind of been the, you know, the standard. Uh, that was the reference that I always used to see, well, how's the band today, you know, and, and see how well WWV's coming in. And, um, and of course set, set my clock and, and everything. But, um, I think I, I use that as, as kind of a, a beacon kind of thing, um, a reference, um, as much as I do the time. And, um, right. so I'm, I'm glad you guys are, are able to do that and, uh, and on the air, given all that yeah. information. A lot of people have written to me and said, well, you know, this is really good for, like, sporadic E, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously now that we're at the end of the sunspot cycle, uh, you know, things like sporadic E and meteor scatter appear to be popular, too, a lot of people using it for that. So, yeah, like you say, time, you know, people might set their clock to it, but uh, it is useful as a uh, probe for other science, so uh, I certainly encourage people to, to do that. Okay, very good. Well, we are going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and take your calls with Matt. And so if you have a question about any of this stuff we've been talking about or some other question about WWV, I, uh, give us a call. The number is 812-NET-HAM-1, or give us a tweet or a call on Skype. So uh, I'll be back, and we'll do that right after this message from Tower Electronics, right here on Ham Talk Live. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you in part by Tower Electronics. Tower Electronics has been the Ham's dime store since 1978. When you need connectors, mobile and handheld antennas, cables, or adapters, visit Scott or Jill at a Ham Fest near you. Or you can order online at pl-259.com or call 920-435-2973. Stock up on those supplies like PL-259 and end connectors, SMA adapters, audio cables, soldering supplies, mobile antennas, and ham sticks. Their silver-plated end connectors are even used on the International Space Station. Tower Electronics carries MFJ, Comet, Daiwa, OPEC, Workman, and HamPro products. And don't miss their 0% off sale going on now. Tower Electronics, online at pl-259.com. Proud to sponsor this episode of Ham Talk Live. Ham Talk Live with Neil Rapp. My shack are yours. Join the conversation. Call us on voice with Skype at Ham Talk Live or give us a call at 812 Net Ham 1. That's 812 638 4261. Now, here's more Ham Talk Live. And thanks to Scott and Jill at Tower Electronics for sponsoring the show tonight to help bring you Ham Talk Live. Coming up, they will be at Shelby, North Carolina on September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Uh, September 10th, they'll be in Findlay, Ohio, and then September 15th and 16th at the Superfest in Peoria, Illinois. So give them a call uh, if you can't make it to any of those at 920-435-2973 or visit them online at pl-259.com. Tell them you heard it on Ham Talk Live. Had a chance to hang out with them a little bit down in Huntsville this past weekend and Oh, Scott, he, he, he took care of my, my connector needs again. I needed some, uh, adapters for school and, and, um, he, he took care of me yet again. So thanks to Scott and, uh, for, uh, supporting the school effort as well, where I teach and, uh, and, uh, for visiting and it was great to see them. So, 
Um, hope uh, if you got to Huntsville, you you had a good time and got to see Hammy. Hammy was uh, running around. We've been uh, putting some pictures up um, from Hammy's visit to the uh, youth lounge and was uh, going around visiting with people. And uh, so we had a good time down in Huntsville. So um, if you haven't been, you ought, to, you ought to check that one out. Well, it's time for your calls now. So if you have a question about WWV for Matt, uh, give us a call. Again, the number is 812-NET-HAM-1. That's 812 638 four two six one or you can skype us just look for ham talk live on skype we're there and uh, you can also tweet us at ham talk live if you would want to do that and uh you know i was joking around with the the all time all the time slogan uh a few months ago on the show, we, we played this little comedy routine that, that was, you know, if if WWV was owned by Clear Channel, the iHeart people uh, that, you know, do all the slogans and everything, and they had all these punny slogans for time. So um, have you ever thought of, of, of trying to use some kind of a, a, a slogan for WWV? Well, you know the uh, all the time, all the time has has been so far the best one I think any of us have ever heard. I, I haven't come up with a better one yet. So uh, if anyone's got any ideas, you know that that uh, certainly will will listen. But uh, that seems to be the best one so far. And that that ad about Clear Channel buying us out that gave a lot of people heartburn. We got a lot of calls and letters <laughs> saying what's happening. So. It, uh, uh, was, uh, we may, uh, we didn't know about it. It was surprised us. We may have to pull that out of the archives here in a minute. But but the voice on there, I guess, was actually the voice, the real voice of WWV for a while. Is that right? And it, yeah, I guess you'd have to ask the the creator of that. Uh, it certainly sounded like it. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, like I said, a lot of people were upset when they they heard that they didn't get that it was a joke. Some you know, just a small handful of people. But uh, yeah, I I it sure sounded like Don Elliott. Yeah, D- Doug Grant, not not K one D G, the other Doug Grant uh, told me it was the real real voice of WWV for a while. So uh, wow. that's pretty cool. Now, what were you telling me about the the voice that's on now? Well, the uh, as everyone knows, Don Elliott uh, was the voice of WWE forever, and uh, until August of 1991, August 13th, of 1991, we we actually contracted to get some new time code generators, and uh, Don Elliott's voice was on a big magnetic drum. It was like a big uh, cassette tape that um, you know was about a foot in diameter, and it just sort of slowly rotated. And it had all these different heads that sat above it that were, um, you know, elevated above the the, the magnetic loop. And uh, as the, the time announcement came up, it would, uh, you know, of course, Don Elliott sat in the studio and said 1, 2, 3, 4, and 10, 20, 30, 40. And so the computer, or what you would call a computer, uh, put together those minutes and seconds and announcements uh, to announce the time each time. And so when the right moment came around, the head would fall and say, you know, at the tone, and then another head would fall down and say, it's, you know, so many hours, minutes, UTC. And uh, so that was the voice of WWV forever. And uh, then we digitized. Well, we went to a digital system, the the new time code generator, and uh, uh, the broadcast at the man- manager at the time um I wish he had put a crowbar in his wallet uh, because we didn't own the voice. It was, uh, I think, uh, Autocron owned the voice. That was their equipment. We leased it, and they said, well, we'll sell it to you for $3,000. And I wish he had done that. And he said, no, we're going to save money. We're going to go with somebody else. And we uh, they hired Lee Rogers of KSFO and um, John Doyle to sit in the studio and say all those things. And we uh, uh, put Lee Rogers' voice on. And, of course, you know, going from Don Elliott to anybody, nobody liked that. So everybody called in and complained for a long time. And so then we went with John Doyle, and um, 
you know, and that, you know, people were still unhappy. But, uh, you know, the trouble we went through, um, the complaints we got, I wish we had just paid the $3,000. I wish I'd taken that out of my pocket and paid it because it would have been <laughs> so much easier than the, all the trouble it caused. But uh, John Doyle is actually the voice now. And if you look at the Wikipedia page, I think it's backwards. And I think that's my fault. I told um, the technician, one of our technicians was being interviewed, uh, and I told him backwards. And it got put in the Wikipedia article backwards, so uh, that needs to be fixed. But John Doyle is the voice now, and Lee Rogers was the voice for a little while back in the 19, uh, 1991 or 92. So that's, uh, that's the way it stands now. All right. Well, let's let's just go ahead and listen to this. This is just under a minute here. Uh, we'll go ahead and listen to this. Now, this is a this is a spoof. This isn't this isn't real, but this is uh, somebody's joke of of what would happen if WWV was run by uh, commercial broadcasters. So here it is. WWV all the time, all the time. Same time, same station, every time, WWV. One, two, three, four, every second counts at WWV. For a good time, call 555 for wwv WWV, for the time of your life. We'll be back with the time on WWV in just a minute. But first, here's another minute. All right, so there you go. There's there's another minute af- in another minute. So yeah, that's, ah, well that's, done. that's good. Yeah, it that's is. Funny. It's well, it's well done. It, and I I laughed and laughed and played it over and over again when I found that and uh, um, just you know heard that same thing over and over again on WWV so much, and then uh, right. here, here comes all time, all the time. <laughs> yeah, I played it for a lot of my friends. They thought it was pretty funny. So very good. Well, hey, give us a call. It's eight one two net ham one eight one two six three eight four two six one. And uh, actually, we've got a question here on the in the chat from uh, Carl KD nine HQT, and wants to know: Will the voices for WWV and WWVH change in the future? Will they change? We have no plans for changing them. Uh, Jane Barbie is actually the voice. Uh, they did digitize her voice. Uh, I think they NBS owned her voice, and they did. Or she went into the studio maybe and re-recorded. But uh, yeah, it's all uh, been digitized, and it's on all all the voices sit on little chips inside the time code generators, and they all play the right pieces at the right time. But we have no plans to to change the the. Uh, voices and uh, we would like to change the announcement at the top of the hour because it doesn't include the 25 megahertz Um, but uh, it it's going to (laughs) be a technological (laughs) nightmare so we'll just have to say somewhere else we're on 25 megahertz all right very good well again uh, if you you want to get in here we've got about three or four minutes left uh, so give us a call at 812-638-4261 or tweet us or uh, get on the chat here. Now, while we're we're waiting to see if we get anybody here, let's talk a little bit about the time correction because every once in a while you gotta you gotta throw in an extra second. So how how do you do that? Well, that's it. Yeah, it's uh, everyone's favorite subject, and that uh, gets us a lot of publicity. You know, the radio stations. And TV stations in Denver and uh, across the country are interested in that. Uh, the, the leap seconds, not being random, they are uh, irregular, uh, not random, but uh, every few months, maybe every 18 months, 24 months, we do put one in. I think it was last December we were putting one in. And um, that's because the Earth's rotation is slowly slowing down and that's primarily because of the moon does tidal breaking on the earth and is slowly dragging the the uh, earth you know dragging the oceans across the earth and that it's slowly slowing us down 
and uh, but the earth speeds up slows down uh, from season to season, year to year, and after it accumulates, we do a DUT1 correction. Uh, you hear the double ticks uh, after the top of the minute, and that tells you how many tenths of a second we are ahead or behind uh, the sun. And uh, so it's important to keep the sun, at, you know, the highest spot in the sky at noontime, uh, or else it would start to drift. Uh, our clock in our sun would drift apart, and you'd have 12 noon at you know sunrise which nobody wants and so what we do is after a certain amount of uh, tenths of a second uh, we uh, or there's an observatory international earth rotation i think in uh, paris they send out a, a notice to everyone a bulletin that says at the end of the year we're all going to do a leap second <clears throat> excuse me and uh, so i don't know i don't think we have one coming up at the end of this year but after a certain amount of tenths of a second accumulate, we actually stall the clock, and that's done just by programming in December 31st. We tell it um, at the last minute or the last second of the last hour or the last day of the year, just it stalls for a second, adds an a extra second. You know, the, the time code genera generator actually reads, goes from 59 seconds to 60 seconds, and so that gives the Earth a chance to catch up during that one second, and uh, usually we split the difference, and uh, so then we're ahead just a few tenths of a second, and you can tell that from the double ticks afterwards. And uh, it turns out that uh, I guess the scientists can actually see the Earth speed up and slow down in the sense that uh, you know the northern hemisphere has a lot more uh, land mass, and in the wintertime when it snows, the angular momentum of the Earth changes because there's more mass up higher and so the earth uh, you know slows down and then when the it melts in the summertime and it all runs off back in the ocean it speeds up again as the as the radius of the earth changes so I, so that was very interesting that they could see that it's you know they can measure it that accurately yeah that's some some very precise measurements and and what what did you say the, the it was 10 to the negative 13th on the, right, the cesium run to yeah they they have a purity of uh, you know about you know ten to the negative thirteen you know which is you know ten to the negative ninth is a nanosecond and uh, so then less than a picosecond uh, of of accuracy of course we can't broadcast that accurately especially from the hf you know because it hits the ionosphere ionosphere is always moving and it, so it accelerates and decelerates. So the WWV signal is only good to about 10 to the negative 7 when it arrives because it's been accelerated, decelerated, and you know bounces off the earth and everything. Uh, WWVB, the 60 kilohertz, uh, you can pretty much recover about 10 to the negative 12 by averaging all those variations over several days, and you can recover about what the cesium is doing. So it works wow. for a lot of people really well. That's uh, that's some interesting stuff, Matt. I, I really am uh, glad you were able to come on the show and, and share that with us and glad and talk to, to us. And and we are just about out of time, but uh, that's uh, some really cool stuff. I always just kind of had this picture of of what WWV looked like and and you know how it all worked. And and you're giving us a good glimpse into. Uh, how that all goes so thank you so much for coming on tonight you're Matt. welcome you're welcome glad to be well, here really appreciate it well that is a wrap for this week's edition of ham talk live thanks to matt deutsch in zero rgt the chief engineer at wwv and he's back to playing all time all the time so uh you can tune in to us next time uh, thanks for listening out there in cyberspace and, uh, thanks for, uh, writing in and, uh, come back at Thursday night, 9 PM Eastern time next week. And, uh, to see our upcoming guests, just go to hamtalklive.com. So thank you for your time this time till next time. This is Neil Rapp, WB9VPG saying 7375 and as always, may the good DX. Be yours.